Tension and release is a common component of, I want to say games, but truly all media. The realness of this technique and the extremely raw feelings it elicits in us make it a pillar in basically all art. Without attribution to any specific emotion, tension is more like a catalyst, a controlling factor installed by some art's artist. But yes, it is most obvious in works of horror. I've talked about it before myself, particularly in my videos on Pikmin, but most of this was inspired by fellow YouTuber Chariot Rider's video on tension in games. In a more recent video of his, which if you haven't already check it out, it's about the definition of roguelikes, queue it up after this or else you're a garbage man, but in this video he summarizes his point as tension is created when the players have enough information to formulate questions but not enough to fully answer them, resulting in a situation where the player is left in anticipation of a resolution to those questions. Backed up by psychological definition, tension basically is when you're fighting a boss for the first time and you haven't been exposed to their entire moveset yet and you don't know whether or not they have a one-hit KO up their sleeve. It's when you walk down a corridor and suddenly the music stops and you can't tell if this is to prepare you for something good or something bad. It's the fucking regenerators in RE4. It's every perilous climb in Death Stranding. It's holding first place in Mario Kart. And yes, it's especially the submerged castle from Pikmin 2. Except unlike other art, game design is considerate of audience interaction. A player doesn't read, watch, or listen to a game, a player plays a game. And so in some cases, instead of tension, when games either fail to obfuscate their rules or just offer subpar challenges, it creates instead what I've called stress. See my past video, Pikmin 3 stresses me. It even rhymes. In many contexts, the words tension and stress can very well be interchanged. They kind of mean the same thing. Stress is certainly an element of tension, however, what makes the big T stand out is, as Chariot said, uncertainty and anticipation. Stress is a pretty normal thing. We feel it to varying degrees when either video games or the real world challenge us and apply pressure on us. For instance, when multitasking. Stress is about overwhelming us. Tension, additionally, has to do with feelings of worry and anxiety, leaving us to fend for ourselves without all the information necessary. That's why a lot of definitions of tension cite examples as relationships, whereas stress is more commonly referred to when talking about, say, work. Tension is suspense, mystery, there's a strategy and decision making involved, whereas stress is just raw challenge. It's grinding you down and seeing if you're strong enough to survive. Stress is basically once you've learned the entire moveset of the boss and you're no longer on the edge of your seat. You're just testing your dexterity and your patience over and over again, trying not to miss a telegraph, press a wrong button, make a mistake. It's managing a chainsaw guy in Mercs. It's navigating every menu in Death Stranding. It's pulling off a good time trial in Mario Kart. And yes, it's the formidable oak from Pikmin 3. In real life, tension is the uncertain times brought on by a global pandemic. Stress is figuring off the logistics to pull off a move. In Pikmin 2, there's a really good level called the Submerged Castle that's basically a masterclass in using tension to control an experience. From the start, it's signposted unlike any other level in the game, warning you of various elemental dangers though only allowing you to bring in water-resistant Pikmin. Then, once inside and given a certain amount of time, it suspensefully springs the dungeon's boss on you early, something which never happens throughout the rest of the game. It pulls out of absolutely nowhere a seemingly invincible colossus, the Water Wraith, whose only attack is an overpowered one-hit-kill steamroll. Suddenly this dungeon is changed from a chill treasure hunting mission like the rest to a cat and mouse hide and seek level where you, the mouse, are charged with the tension of trying to predict the position of your stalker in the shadows all the while completing unrelated tasks and trying to preserve your limited supply of Pikmin. It's fantastic. This level and the unique challenge it provides hinges on the uncertainty and randomness of both its layouts floor per floor and the mysterious otherworldly opponent it provides. Pikmin 3 then tried to recycle this concept, a one-off in its predecessor that worked precisely because it was a one-off, for its final boss encounter no less. The final level of Pikmin 3 is about rescuing an unconscious captain by taking him through the maze-like interior of a tree while a new wraith, this one with a golden shimmer, stalks you. Except there's a key difference. Unlike the previous game, whose wraith was untraceable, who would disappear into the shadows, feigning a retreat only to pop back out intermittently just when you got comfortable, Goldilocks over here is literally always marked by a big green dot on your map. Not only that, instead of roaming around randomly to simulate some sort of intelligence, the game explicitly tells you that the wraith will always follow the signal of the unconscious captain, meaning it effectively is just retracing your steps as you carry him. 
The best level from Pikmin 2 was taken, stripped of all its uncertainty, its mystery, its tension, and turned into a final boss room where you're basically trying to outrun your own shadow. There isn't a single relevant question about the Wraith that you don't have enough information to answer. Where's the bastard? Uh, let me look at my map. Oh yeah, there he is. Where's he heading? Uh, let me look at my map. Oh yeah, that way. Where should I move to get out of his way? Uh, let me think. Uh, yeah, basically anywhere but uh, where I've already been. At one point, the level even opens up a giant circular path, trivial trivializing it. I cannot pronounce it. At one point, the level opens up a giant circular path, trivializing it even more. The challenge of not letting the Wraith catch up to you is reduced to just pacing around in a circle. Pikmin 3 is basically all about stress. And don't get me wrong, th that's fine. Giving you three captains to control at a time, it's a game at its core about multitasking. Every level is about doing three different things at the same time. So it suits it to have a final boss that amps up the stress even more. I mean, when you think about it, this guy doesn't really have any agency of his own. It's just an extension of whichever of your captains is carrying Olimar, just a few steps behind at any given point, you know, like, like some sort of tail. So the final challenge in a game about dividing your attention three ways is to divide it again a four for a little while. Eh. So I, I think about this distinction a lot. The idea of tension versus stress. I think it's one of the most important topics I've ever touched on in any of my videos, which of course is only due to Chariot, so once again, please go check them out or else you're uh, a stinky asshole. But my issue is that the specific example I've given is pretty hard to follow unless you're just as familiar with the Pikmin series. So I've devised a little demo to get the same concept across using some old school games I figured more people might have heard about. This is uh, Crocodile Dentist, a game I know I had as a kid but couldn't track down, so I picked this one up instead. Uh, I'm not sure where it was made, but it probably isn't here because um, modern, elegant, and in fashion are probably not the words I would use to describe this uh, fucking anxiety inducing piece of green plastic, but uh, you know. The rules are supposedly as follows um, one, open wide. 2. Press down on a tooth. 3. Oh no, chomp. Uh, 4. Hooray, a winner. Uh, this is kind of misleading in my opinion though, because it seems to imply that the one that gets bit is the winner, and this is absolutely false. So allow me to provide my own interpretation of the rules, the way the game actually works, which I've deduced through inspection and what I can gather from the faint memory of a commercial on YTV back in the day. So to start, you open the croc's mouth, revealing an array of 13 bottom teeth. Each tooth is actually a button, and the act of opening the mouth somehow randomly loads one of them to trigger the mouth to close, thus making whoever picks it the loser. So on your turn, you pick a tooth, and in depressing it, you have a 1 in 13 chance of getting chomped effectively the measure of tension. As the game goes on and other players take turns pressing down teeth, the tension increases as the chance of getting snagged raises. The tension in this game can be measured and plotted. It's the total number of teeth minus the product of the number of players and the current turn. That's to say, if two people are playing, then the tension increases by two for every turn played. It's basically the same thing as saying that it's the total number of teeth minus the number of teeth pressed, but I like including the number of players and turns into its definition because it reveals a core truth about the game, which is that from an individual player's perspective to whom the tension only matters on their turn, the tension they feel on that turn is a function of how many other people they're playing with, aka how many people have and will press a tooth before and after their current and next turn. Unfortunately, there is an unintended flaw in the game that can be exploited to break it. As a game whose intended tension is drawn purely from randomness, no skill should be relevant in its play. However, an experienced player will know that the trigger tooth can be felt before pressing it. It resists just a little bit more than other teeth, and thus a pro is given avenue to avoid it. This is made worse when such a pro is being an asshole about it and reveals to the other players which one is the hot tooth, thus changing the game from one of chance to one predetermined by order and direction, aka catch a tiger by its toe. However, a house rule can be applied to resolve this issue. Inheriting the touch-move rule from chess and forcefully joining the act of choosing a tooth to that of pressing it can disallow a cheater-cheater from feeling around first. And thus concludes my, I want to say legitimate critical analysis of, of, of this um, surprise win-out funny game, Crocodile Dentist. As another example of a tension-based randomness game, uh, here's what I knew as Pop-Up Pirate, but according to this box, is uh, Crazy Pirates Come On! Again, looks like they're overselling this thing a little bit, what with the super amazing and breathtaking... <laughs>
The same idea as Croc Doc, you insert this scurvy dog into the top of the barrel, which again somehow loads one of 16 slits along the outside to trigger him to pop up. Then, however the fuck many players you want, take turns stabbing little daggers into it until one of you springs the trap and he pops up, probably taking your eye out along with him, or at the very least, your breath. Again, the tension can be measured and grows as a function of the number of slits versus the number of players and the current turn. This time though, I don't think there's a way to feel around for a hotspot, so no place for a pumpkin eater. Now for a different kind of game with a different kind of challenge... Perfection. Perfection today is my example of a stress-driven game. So if you've never seen it before, Perfection is a game about placing 25 unique plastic plugs into each their own unique plastic hole under a 60 second timer. If the timer runs completely down before you've placed all the pieces and hit the switch off, the board springs up and sends all the pieces flying at your face to rub in just how much of a failure you are. It's not very hard. It's just a few rounds and quickly you kind of memorize the placement of each piece. At that point it's more a challenge of dexterity as you try not to fumble around too hard with the pieces. As opposed to the other games I've demonstrated, there's no hidden weakness, no hot spot. In fact, there's no information hidden from the player at all. The timer is labeled and shows that it's exactly 60 seconds. Each piece is unique, none is more or less important than any other, and each has exactly one spot it fits in. The game doesn't obfuscate these from you in any way. Really, most of the challenge comes from the fact that human brains aren't so good at keeping track of so many things at once. It's basically only difficult for the same reason remembering a phone number is. You can't really plot or measure the tension of this game because there is none. You could maybe try to plot the difficulty curve, but I don't think it's a valuable descriptor of the difficulty. Like, technically the difficulty of placing a piece is related to the total number of holes filled versus empty, but the thing is, you have to fill every hole. So even though placing the final few pieces is much easier than the first few, it's only so easy because those first ones were placed by you. You can't, like, skip that step. So I want to say the higher difficulty at the beginning kind of balances itself out over the easier difficulty at the end, kind of giving the act of playing the game a linear difficulty. The only real change in difficulty occurs, I would say, when your brain starts to store for short term the information necessary to place the blocks quickly, and at that point the difficulty decreases, aka you get skilled at it. The difficulty technically does change as the timer goes down and you place pieces, but I think a more accurate snapshot of it is to say that the act of playing one round of perfection has a certain and constant linear difficulty. So there's no secret, there's no hidden danger you're trying to avoid. The question of the game is can you get all the pieces placed in under 60 seconds or will you fail? And as the player you have all the information you need to answer that. In a video game, this is more akin to a time trial or a speedrun or something. The pop-up of the board if you fail is completely independent from the challenge of the game. It's a gimmick. Whether it was that or anything else that signaled failure it wouldn't matter. It's artificial. Really all this is, is a test of skill and a timer. It's a race under pressure. And, and that's not to say that a stress-driven game is worse than one more about tension. These are different kinds of challenges that different people will enjoy more than others, that games might employ at different times dependent on whatever the fuck they're trying to do. I think what's important to note though is that tension is a better way to control an emotional experience, whereas stress is more suited towards triggering feelings of being overwhelmed and then maybe intense accomplishment once you're done. Tension is about mood, stress is about pressure. And I think when it comes to what Pikmin 3 was trying to do with its final boss, there was an intense, shoot me, little narrative dissonance, and I think that's what upset me. The final level about securing Olimar and traversing the maze while the Wraith follows you, ending with a big boss fight at the base of the tree, is meant to feel tense, I believe. I mean, the whole game thus far has been about multitasking under stress, overloading you with responsibilities. Hey dude, handle three captains! Hey dude, handle five types of Pikmin! Hey dude, handle your juice reserve! H handle all these multi-tiered fucking puzzles! If you've made it as far as the Oak, then the game should know by now that you're able to perform under stress. So, the addition of new mechanics in the final stage felt like they were meant to confuse you, meant to surprise you and make you work under that same familiar pressure, stress, but with an added element of unknown, of tension. But then it handed you the cheat sheet and said, ah, fuck it, just multitask some more. It kills the mood entirely. I think this was a waste of a scenario that in the prequel made for a much better encounter that was legitimately shocking and terrifying. Again, there's nothing wrong with liking perfection over Crocodile Dentist. If skill challenges in games are what you dig, then, then dig away. But when it's clear that the game is trying to set a certain mood and then picks one avenue of challenge over another, I think that's worthy of criticism. The difference between tension and stress in game design is the difference between the submerged castle and the formidable oak in Pikmin. It's the difference between pop-up pirate and perfection. It's the difference between a needle in a haystack and a 52 pickup. 
One draws blood, one draws sweat. The end. Hello and welcome to the end screen! It's me, your boy, the Welcome to the End Screen. Haven't I don't think I've done a real like a real like on camera end screen in quite a while. It may have no the VR video I did. Fuck it. By the way, if you thought I only had uh, one weird cow statue, uh, get fucked. Space cow, what up? Got my my boy. Or I mean I guess it's a cow, so that's probably incorrect. Yeah, the udder on this thing is uh Pretty well defined, even in the spacesuit. I don't know if you can catch that. First of all, thank you for watching all the way to the end of this uh, rather shorter video. This end screen is probably going to elongate it unnecessarily. If you're new, uh, end screens are something I've been doing for literally years at this point. Um, it's kind of how I avoid ever having to do like a channel update video. I just kind of shoot the shit at the end of a video, um, and my engagement kind of drops. It's kind of funny. Like like YouTube analytics wise, it's 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 basically like SEO suicide <laughs> but fuck it fuck it I'm an artiste and speaking of artists uh, a, a, a big oh no chomp to uh, all my uh, donators on patreon who uh, are all written on my phone uh, so I'm going to cut to footage of something else for a minute so you don't see me reading right off the screen but the all are in case you didn't know Adustus Austin Green Cosmic Crown Disgruntled Mushroom Final Blue Man Glenn Strawn Grant Whalen Oh Baby Yeah Isaac Holland, Josh Burcham, Josh Ferguson, got two of them, uh, just <laughs> Wally, <laughs> I don't know why I felt the need to point that out, uh, just Wally, as I said, <laughs> god damn it, Kiwi, Nathan Walker, Nova Canoe, Peter Sv uh, <laughs> Peter Zankowski, Tito's, Vin Jock, and William Van Zant. Oh, and uh, because last time uh, there was a technical difficulty that prevented me from uh, reading out Austin Green's name, I promised that I would read out Austin Green's name a second time. So Austin Green, uh, again, for f probably four times now at this, well, five times, I guess, if you count the first. I don't know. I lost track of how many times I've said Austin Green. But that's another one. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. I'm gonna I'm gonna shut this shit down. I'm going to uh, cut it out because, like I said, talking this much about things that are not the meat and potatoes of this video is uh, effectively YouTube suicide. Yeah, that's it. All right. Thank you everybody for hanging out and uh, catch you later, alligator. Ah! Oh, he's a crocodile. Fuck. Oh. Uh, in a while, crocodile. <laughs>